So we were kids who had different point of view on the commemoration. So we said, if you want to learn about this, uh, we have to, to start it ourselves. So 2016 to 2020, mm. Uh, we renovated six homes. We built one house from scratch. We gave easy access to clean water in the, the, the homes of those six families. Uh, we gave uh, health insurance for those five years to 30 families and solar lights to 15. Oh, as the youth, as the younger generation, we need to help the older generation help them to help us. Mm. We need to find better ways to ask questions. Hello there. Our guest this week on the Long Form Podcast is Christian Inhuari, an activist. Christian is the founder of Our Past, an initiative that aims to educate young people about the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. He joins us this week to discuss his personal journey, as well as the work that Our Past does in the larger Rwandan community. Hello there. Before we dive into today's conversation, have you subscribed to our channel yet? If you haven't, do so. And remember to share your thoughts with us in the comments below and like this video. Your support means a lot. Now let's get into it. Bueno, Christian, welcome to the Long Forum. Thank you so much. Um, by the time this, this, this podcast comes out, it will be the 7th of April. Uh, actually, no, the 8th of April. Yeah. Uh, so it will be a day after uh, we start the genocide commemoration period. Yeah. Uh, I think you and your organization, you're working on something. Yeah. Can you share <laughs> what you're working on? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, yeah. Uh, as our past initiative, we are working on our 14th edition of our past event. Uh, our past event is a youth commemoration event mm -hmm. that uh, brings together now over 2,700 young people. Mm -hmm. And the goal, uh, one, is to educate the young people and also educate ourselves mm -hmm. um, about our history, the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, the root causes of the genocide mm. and uh, the division and how it started. And then also look at uh, where we are going as a country, how far we are as a, as a country and what as the young people of this nation can do uh, to keep it going. Mm. Uh, second is to uh, use uh, the different ways of uh, delivering messages to encourage young people to also go out there and ask questions. Uh, means uh, we have poems, we have uh, drama, we have uh, music, uh, we have uh, interaction with different leaders in different positions. And <clears throat> we do this hoping to raise some questions uh, that these young people can go back home and ask their parents and uh, yeah, so you're, you're going to do that, but yeah. do you have a particular event that, that you yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do? Yeah, we, we are doing an event on the, on the 9th of mm -hmm. April. Uh, we are having the event at uh, Nyanza and Kichuchiro Genocide Memorial mm -hmm. uh, at the amphitheater. Uh, and uh, the event starts at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, until uh, 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. So those will be open at 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. And uh, we encourage all the young Rwandans and foreigners that are here mm. to join us and as we commemorate mm. uh, uh, the victims of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi and also <coughs> learn on how we can prevent uh, such a tragedy to happen again. So what exactly, for the people who do come to that event mm. on the 9th, mm. what exactly should they look forward to? They should look to go deep uh, in learning the history, mm. but they should also look into finding in uh, attracting ways to young people uh, uh, that is very understandable to them, 
uh, that means uh, artistic ways of giving them the, the message you want to give to yeah. them. Uh, that's why we use all the means I just mentioned yeah. to to be able to, you know, art is a universal language yeah. and can be understood by uh, any age, any and anyone. Yeah. So we are having poems, we are having theatres, we are having testimony yeah. because it's very important to also uh, be able to listen to people who experience the genocide uh, uh, and their life during the genocide, their life before or even after, uh, where are they today and how are they building, rebuilding their, you know, they, they, they themselves and their families and how are they contributing to, yeah. to, to, the, to the country's yeah. uh, progress. If it's not a secret, do you uh, already have a chief guest? Uh, not yet, mm. not yet. Uh, we, call, we, we are in discussion with different institutions. Mm. We are yet to receive a confirmation of mm. who's coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really cool. Um, and obviously, uh, during this conversation, we will touch on our past initiative in a bit more detail, yeah, yeah, where it yeah, came yeah. from yeah. Uh, and what your, you and your team do. Yeah. But before we do that, I would like to go into our past. Yeah. Uh, forgive uh, the pun. I would like to go maybe 30 years ago, uh, around this period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you were four years old. Yeah. Uh, in April of 1994. Yeah. What, if you can, can you take us back to that time? Can you share with us your memories of before the genocide started? If yeah. there are any memories that you can remember, yeah. maybe help us uh, understand your family situation, mm. uh, where you used to live. Um, and then, if possible, if there are certain memories that you have of mm. what happened during those 100 days uh, between the 7th of April to the 4th of yeah. July, yeah. if there are memories that you can remember, <clears throat> please, can you share them with us? Thank you so much. I think uh, as, a, as a three, almost four year old, uh, you don't remember much. Mm. You just, uh, I, I don't know if that, that's the right uh, word to use, but you have flashbacks. Mm. You have images, some of them they have explained uh, what they are. Uh, for example, uh, if maybe you jump some stages and you get to Mjumba mm. and You ask about the lines you used to see of many people <clears throat> waiting, mm. and that was the people waiting for food, mm. to get food mm. in the refugee camp. And I remember a few things. One, I remember uh, my mom uh, putting us, like laying us down like on the same line, mm. um, and later on, she said that she was doing that because she was always praying that if they are going to kill us, mm. she, she doesn't want to stay or any of her kids to stay here suffering. Mm. So that was the, the, uh, the idea behind. So she was putting you, she was laying yeah, you on, yeah, the, on, on the line the, so that what happened? Yeah, yeah. the what? three uh, siblings, mm -hmm. me, my big sister and my big brother mm. on the same uh and the the the, the one that was uh, was still uh, a few month uh, mm. baby so mm. so the idea was because we left our home i think on the 7th where was your home uh nyamirambo okay. uh, mumena uh, cell mm. that's under the college saint andre mm. so the people from that neighborhood they were uh, afraid to uh, mm. then at the Catholic Church that was there. Uh, then my dad joined the army, army the RPF, RPF, uh, the RPF uh, uh, 
a few months or one year before uh, the genocide started. Mm. So he was in, in, in uh, back and forth going. Uh, he knew some people at the same day. Uh, now the parliament, he, you know, he, he was just gathering some information of what was going on, like mm. any other uh, 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 Rwandan who was uh, like feeling like they are, uh, they are being threatened of getting killed and all that. And um, on the 7th, we first went to Koresh Seth Andre. So uh, what I remember was uh, moving from there, we passed by uh, one one house that was a very, very huge compound. Mm -hmm. We stayed there for one night, then we went back home because it wasn't bad, that bad yet. Mm -hmm. Then my dad came back. He started asking the neighbors mm. to, you know, to get ready and prepare themselves to to leave. I I don't remember exactly the dates, but mm. it was in the very very first few days of the genocide. Then we went from uh, Yamirambo, We passed by the valley that goes to the Ebero. We went to Rivero, then after Rivero, we left. So from the, the, the Rivero going to Sende, mm. that's where I remember a few things. Mm. Uh, someone taking me on uh, his shoulder, and then uh, they talked about someone getting killed because they were carrying him like that. Mm. Then they put me down, mm. you know? Um, then I remember a few times they said, uh, lay down, because maybe some bullets were mm. uh, going around back and forth. I don't remember much about Sende, but I remember get, going from Sende to, to Jumba, not much, but I, uh, in, in, in the refugee camp, I remember that line of people waiting for mm. food. I remember a huge house, I think that's where they used to service their, their, their vehicles because there was a, a huge... Um, uh, a garage? Or yeah, it was like a garage mm -hmm. with uh, the, you know, the, the oil, the, the black oil they, mm -hmm. they moved from the mm -hmm. Vidange. Yeah, Vidange, yeah, yes. yeah. So, um, and then I remember that because my dad used to be a truck driver, mm -hmm. And that's what he was doing uh, when he joined the, the, the RPF. So I remember he used to come at, at night sometimes and we ran after the, 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 the truck. Yeah. And um, these are the, I remember because they told me that I, I shouldn't be running after the like old, uh, the big brothers and big sisters and mm -hmm. the people that were, you know, kids, how kids are. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's pretty much the few things I remember mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. uh, the first few days of the genocide. Yeah. I'd like to ask, what, so I can, yes, I, I understand you saying that, you know, there, there's a few things that you remember mm -hmm. here and there when you mm -hmm. really think about it, but do you, I, I can imagine that there must have been some effect on your mental health from what you saw at the time. Yeah. Do you ever get, maybe you're sleeping and then you just have these dreams, very mm. vivid. And then you're like, what does this mean? Does this, mm. <clears throat> I guess what I'm trying to ask you mm. is from those things that you saw, or were a part of, even as a child, do they still affect you today? Uh, I think because I had my uh, younger sister mm. and she was killed with my grandparents. And I tried so hard, like I tried so hard to remember how Mm. She looked like, mm. because I don't have that um, 
image mm. uh, exactly. I remember that I had a sister, but the image is so hard to to get or to to um, to picture mm. to picture uh, who she was, and you know. So it's so hard. That's that's what um, that's what always comes back. Another thing that comes back is. Uh, they always, uh, growing up, they used to ask me that there's a time we went to their grandparents on my mom's side. And uh, I was asking, I was asking them why uh, their, the, the cows is uh, bed sheet looks like uh, onions. You know, the, the onions are uh, heads. Mm. You know, there's the onion, then mm-hmm. there's the, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, the leaves mm-hmm. that, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So I was like, Mm. You know? So this is the only thing, but I don't remember asking that question. Yes. But I can recall seeing like the cows at my grandparents' house. And these are a few things that always comes back, but mm. uh, most of the time it's around this time. Because yeah. that's when growing up, that's when the mood used to change at my house and um, you see things changing, you see some people crying for no reason. Like, I was here five minutes ago, you were doing okay, no one, you know? So mm. these are some of the things growing up was very hard to understand. Yeah. And keeps raising like many questions on mm. how, why, who, mm. you know? So I feel like yeah, that's that's pretty much Mm-hmm. Some of the small, small things that yeah. comes back. You, you talk about a younger sister who, and grandparents who tragically mm-hmm. passed away. Uh, if 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 it's okay for mm-hmm. you to share it, uh, is it okay yeah, if I yeah, ask yeah, about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Was was your younger sister the only one of the sib- of your siblings who passed away during the genocide? Yes, that's correct. Uh, and and why was she the only one? So I think they say that since she was born, or since the last time their grandparents saw her, mm. she was still a baby. So they they wanted to see her after uh-huh. like, uh, because I was like one year older than her, mm-hmm. or one year and a few months. So they said they wanted to see her. So she went to Gitarama where they, uh, mm. they were living. So they were you you were not together as a family in April of '94. Yeah, she she had she they sent her to see the grandparents mm. because no one knew exactly that on the seventh yes. things are going to. Of course. Yeah, and uh, that's that's how she was killed with uh, both grandparents mm. and uh, uh, six of my mom's siblings, mm. yeah, because they were 11 and only five of them survived, mm. yeah. Hmm. It's, it's, well, you know, sometimes when you hear these stories, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. it's, you think about just how many lives have been lost and, and for what, you know? You yeah. Know? Do you yeah. ever ask yourself, like, why, why, why? Why did so it happen? The why is I don't I don't think the why is ever going to live. Mm. Maybe one day, I don't know. But because you also get to to hear about how they used to live, mm. who they were as you know, as a person who my granddad was, um, how they used to live with the neighbors, how he was a teacher and it's so hard to even start with why, yes, but how does a human being wake up in the morning and be like, you have to go? Yeah. You know? So these are some of the, the, the how and why the, it's always like, it's a couple, it goes hand in hand because yeah. After you're asking how can you do that, then why why did you get to the point where you have to do it? Mm. How bad was it that you wanted these these people to, you know, yeah. to go? And 
you never get the, the right answer. Did you, did, did the, the people or the persons yeah. who murdered your grandfather uh, and, and, and the rest of the family, um, did you ever find out who it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, one of his neighbors. Oh. And it was a guy that my grandfather was the teacher to his kids. Oh, wow. And two, they had, uh, uh, they had given each other cows. Hmm. They, they were friends. They were neighbors. Wow. I mean, we hear those stories yeah, all the time. They were right? neighbors uh, that some of my mommy's last memories was the time they were there. Mm. I think it was after she got married mm. to my dad. And they were there when my grandfather was giving a cow to this guy. Mm. So it wasn't that the guy didn't have cows, but it was because of the, the friendship they had as neighbors, mm. as a teacher to your kids, mm -hmm. as, you know, someone you share yes. almost like everything, yeah. you know. And to that point, uh, you know, giving a cow in, in our tradition is the highest form of friendship, mm. love, appreciation, and all that. So going from to, that's why it gets crazy, going from to that, to someone saying, you know, you know, I'm so you know? yeah. So it, that's when it started getting um, hard to understand. And uh, yeah, he he died in in in, uh, in prison after he tried and uh, found guilty of the crimes. Uh, Did your uh, family ever get a chance to ask him why? Yeah, I have two uncles who used to go. One is my direct uncle. The other one is a cousin to to my mom, and they never got the. No, they always, I don't know if it, they always say that it was some kind of, some type of uh, demons, mm. evil, Satan, and uh, mm. you know, all this kind of stuff that pushed them. No one will ever get the answer to that, if yeah. it's true or not. And... Uh, one of that uh, cousin to my mom uh, was later on um, uh, he got sick mm. and he had now I know what the 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 the, the sickness was. Mm. It's uh, something called uh, broken heart syndrome. Oh. Yeah, that's when someone goes through so much, the pain and stuff. It's not that the heart has any other issue of doing its job, but mm. uh, it, it's depression, uh, sadness, mm. the pain of you know of losing loss, yeah. someone, and so that's that's uh, the heartbroken syndrome. Mm. And um, yeah, they I said they can see what they can do, but uh, before they operated him, they asked him to like <laughs> write his his will. You know his will and a letter to his family. You know some of those stories. I just you know you you hear them. Uh, mm -hmm. Fortunately, I I personally wasn't here. Yeah. Uh, although I lost my grandparents from my mother's side, mm -hmm. they 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 were killed in. In uh, that time, they, it was called Butare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, again, an old, old, old woman, very kind. The story was mm. that she was just very kind, and um, mm. she was killed by a neighbor. They just threw her body, and even up to today, the they never found it. No, and they refused to yeah, tell the, us the, the, about the, it. Yeah, that's the crazy part, and mm. that's I think a similar story with. My grandmom and my dad, my grand stepmom, because she was uh, my mm. dad's stepmom, mm. and they never found the body. Yeah, and for her, she was killed a bit earlier. I think early nineties, late eighties. Yeah, I think one of the things that we don't do, we don't talk enough about, 
is the fact that genocide did not start in 1994, April. No, it didn't. Because uh, before that, these are stories that I I, I learned uh, very very recently, like in 2017, mm. uh, on my my daddy's side. We never spoke about his past because I think. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about it. And which I also has uh, someone who was doing our past, trying to find solutions, trying to find the answers to some of the questions we didn't, we didn't uh, uh, have the answers to. Mm -hmm. So we talked about it and he told me how they went to Burundi, then his mom uh, got sick and she said she's not going to die in exile. She wants to go back home. If mm. she's going to die, she has to, yeah. you know. Then his dad uh, was very old, but uh, uh, also one of the cause of death was the way he was beaten uh, in 84. Uh, and they told me that my grand stepmom uh, uh, was killed and they never found the body. They know ju just that she was killed at one of the churches in Nyaruguru, but they never found the body. So it's, you know, hearing some of these stories, the stories that you've just, you're just telling me about, it's sometimes shocking. Um, and obviously you were too young to sometimes re remember everything. Yeah. Uh, but obviously your parents were there. Yeah. Um, you've told me a, a little bit about your mom's side, yeah. you know, your grandparents and, mm -hmm. and that, that, the tragedy that happened in, the Jitara, in Jitarama. Yeah. How about your dad? So I think uh, it's, it's also new, like, uh, it's also new to me that uh, I talked to my dad about it in 2017 mm. and I kind of forced him to, <laughs> I triggered his emotions and his memories. Mm. I went to Nyaruguru with uh, two of my nieces. When? Uh, it was 2017 mm. during Kwibuka. Mm. So I went there for Kwibuka and um, I texted him on my way there. So I didn't tell him until I was, because when they came back, my two nieces, they are also, we are almost the same age. Mm. And when they came back, they said, we can't keep, uh, you know, doing the same thing uh, our parents have done, like to kind of escape from, from that part, you from know? their past, from their past. We have to know, we have to find out. So for them, there is a time they, they, they came from the US and they went there before that time, before 2017. Then mm -hmm. they were like, you know, this time we have to, to go together. I was like, yeah, me too, I want to know because mm -hmm. as much as I've learned about my mommy's side, I've been to, to the barriers of her relatives and all that, but we've never done the same thing with uh, my dad since the genocide, so few stories of him being in the army, uh, how some of his brothers used to, to be, you know, but never talking about, and these are stories I was hearing because I was sitting in the evening room when he had visitors and, you know. So, uh, and I think it was a similar case uh, with uh, my siblings. Mm -hmm. And um, 2017, uh, went there. Um, so when I texted him, that's when I saw like another picture of my dad I never mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. uh, what was, what happened? Uh, the reaction was, uh, please don't greet, I mean. Don't touch their hands. No, don't touch their hands. Uh, if you can bring your own food, mm. uh, if it's not hard for you to move from where you're going to have the night of... Uh, the night vigil. Yeah, the night vigil. Go back to Huye, sleep somewhere in a hotel, then go back there in the morning, you know? Mm. So you see someone who cares too much about that. You no, know, he cares about your safety. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, your safety, he's scared of something. But it's like he just woke up because... Mm. 
growing up as a kid, we had that dad who is very strict, who who beat you like seriously if you if you you know you're just being a kid making some mistakes. Mm. But we never had a chance of having that, you know, the the care. The care mm. emotionally he wasn't there. Mm. Now I see, you know, he's paying too much attention to what mm. I'm doing in that moment. So I was like, yeah, 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 sure. But my niece is new as well. So when you go to, there's a place called Kwa Haji when you're going to Huye. Mm. Mm. In Nyanza, we passed by, we bought some milk. Mm. In Kivuguto, we bought some Brochette. mandazi yeah. and things you can take. Mm-hmm. Then we went there. Mm. The night ended. We It was at a school. It was during like the, the holidays. We slept in their dorms. They had no sheets, but we didn't want to ask anyone. And then in the morning, we had the milk we brought the day before and the mandazi and all that. Then we came back to Kigali. Um, so after like three, four days, he texted me. He was like, uh, come home early. Uh, there are a few things I wanted to ask you. you know? mm. So he started asking me how was the event. Sunday, like I wanted just to know the summary of the commemoration event. So then from there we started talking. Mm. We had... I think around like five, six hours of conversation. What were you talking about? Uh, his past. Mm. More of, oh, I know that place. We grew up around that. Uh, he also was aware of what was going on because he knew the people they were uh, burying that mm. same day. Mm. And we started talking how they went to Burundi in, um, I think, 59 or a little bit mm. after how his mom got sick while they were there. And he was very young. Uh, and the mom said she's not going to die in exile. She came back. She mm. died in 63. Uh, the dad got another wife, and in a special case that my dad and the stepmom were cool. Uh, so my granddad died in 84. Mm. Uh, they said he was too old, but uh, for the people like my uh, uh, my cousin, whose uh, dad is the brother to my dad, uh, he's very old. And he said that he, he wasn't that they beat him. Mm. And, he didn't uh, die of old age. Yeah, he was beaten yeah, yeah, to death. He, yeah, he was beaten to death. Or oh, he was beaten then later on. Uh, passed away. Passed away, yeah. yes. And uh, they told me that they never found my stepmommy's body. And she mm. was killed. To go back to your question, she was killed in the early 90s. Mm. So the genocide was there. People were getting beaten, people were getting killed. And then um, he got married to my mom right after his dad passed away. Mm. Uh, life was okay. I was born in 90, right after the two weeks after the very first RPF, RPA mm. attack. Mm. And... Um, so 15th of October? 15th of October, mm. yeah. So... Is um, that why you're called uh, Inwari? So that's that's also... that's also There is a time I had a debate uh, like uh, with people on Twitter. They were saying, uh, give us uh, the... Uh, why you, you have... Uh, this name, yeah, like mm. what's the meaning behind your Kinyaranda name? So, um, actually, during that conversation, that's when my dad told me that he wanted to join the RPF, but mm. he didn't know he would make it back. He was like, I, if I have to go and I don't make it back, you know, mm. the last born now, 
uh, go and be in Mali, you know? Mm. So protect the family and all that. So that's, that's, that was also something good to, good to know. So, and then 92, he started like gathering information. Then 93, late 93, that's when I think he started now joining on and off, knowing what was going on because he still had his truck. Uh, so then the genocide came. So he, as someone who had the, the stepmom, so he had stepsisters and brothers. Mm. So one of his sister from his mom uh, was killed and cut into pieces with uh, uh, her, her kids, four kids. And that was also in Nyarugu? Yeah, yeah, when the genocide started. Mm. So they told my dad that the last image of her they had, she had no private parts. Oh, goodness. So, yeah. And after that, as kids who grew up here after the genocide, mm. uh, I think like a week ago we were talking about how we used to go to, I think it was 97, that's when me, or 98, that's when I started primary school. Going to school, seeing where there are signs saying uh, the, the, this is like a danger zone because there might be a grenade. Mm. Uh, they used to have signs, you know, the 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 head, mm. the uh, the skull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They 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 put on um, somewhere that there is danger. Going to school, see that because one. Setandri was many people have been killed there mm. at Setandri, College of Setandri. And uh, also, they were using that part to connect Rebero and Nyamirambo because, you know, after the RPF uh, took over Rebero, they wanted to come to mm. Nyamirambo and mm. uh, liberate the, the, that area. So then growing up, uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, I would say in that period, it was uh, a nice school for me. We, as kids, we had all we needed. Uh, we had access to education. And, but also to talk about my daddy's side, growing up, we never had like his presence as. He was, he was there, he was asking how we are doing at school. He was um, being a dad, take you out once a month, you eat brochette, you drink Fanta orange, then you go back home. Mm. Or once every two months, you have, uh, uh, you, they buy a shoe, you know, uh, or, you know, those kind of things a mm. kid just need to, to be happy. You don't need much as a kid. Yeah. And, um, I think 2002-2003 that's when it started getting worse for my dad. What do you mean worse for him? Uh, because he used to drink and yeah. to smoke a lot mm -hmm. which is which was normal and a case for many other men. Men and it was bad. He used to I remember this one I, I remember because I was uh, a bit mm -hmm. older. He used to drive around like 2 a.m. Mm. to go uh, see where I can find a cigarette. Mm. And he was driving a truck. Mm. So you can imagine on a level at 2 in the morning, you just want to have some smoke and cool down and come back and sleep. I guess, and, and this is sometimes I think why, you know, the older generation needs to tell these stories because it helps younger people understand who they are yeah. and what uh, they've seen. Yeah. Because I, I guess if you don't know someone's past, yeah, yeah. then you cannot even understand who they are. Yeah, yeah, who they are or when they'll tell you that they, are, they are going to achieve A, B, C, D or they are going to do this, you'll be like, you're crazy. But if you know that they've been through wars, mm. be like, ah, I know this guy have been through mm. A, B, C, D, they can even go through, mm. you know? So then um, 
2004. I think that's when he got sick and he stopped mm. drinking and smoking. Mm. He it was very bad. It was very, very bad that mm. um, family's friends had to intervene. You know how his things used to be. Uh, saying some of the things uh, we had for for us to be able to to have him back, mm. and um, uh, he is doing well now. He okay. doesn't smoke or drink anymore, and you no, know, he was a father, and he still is mm. a cool one. And um, I say that emotionally, we never never had them. And to me, because of growing up after the genocide, one case I know that was everywhere was having a house of three living room, uh, three bedrooms and just a living room. Mm. And you find yourselves like you are 15, 16 people in that house. Yeah. Actually, when I think about it today, I'd be like, how did they do it? How did how, they feed all these people? Yeah. How... How did they manage to feed, to shelter, to give them what to wear? That's when I like I commend the parents of that time to have managed to help us and get where we are today. Yeah. And we had two uncles from my dad's side yeah. who were also in the army. Yeah. And we kind of grew up in a military camp. Yeah. <laughs> so to say that anything you do as a kid, you get punished as a soldier. You know? uh-huh. uh, I remember getting uh, getting beaten, and they will ask you to uh, to push up push up mm. position. Yeah. And if you if you if they beat you once and you scream or you do like that, yeah. that one is not, uh, uh, doesn't count. Yeah. So you can imagine, one, it was a good thing to have that, I would say that the being strict and reminding you of the do's and the don'ts, but it was beyond what a kid, uh, the, the way a kid should be punished. and. I think one of the things that I've realized as I get older and I also have kids is how much of our trauma we transmit to our children through our actions. And I can only imagine, for example, like men like your father who saw tragedy almost their entire lives, Mm -hmm. uh, how that would affect how they raise their kids. Um, So that's just... It's, it's yeah, a challenge. It, it, is, it is a challenge. And me as a kid in primary school, uh, I used to fight. Mm. Because you probably also had trauma too. Yeah, I used to fight. And growing up, start, starting realize, realizing what mental health is, mm. how can you release the, the pain the, mm. in, in a way you don't know. What the way you're getting beaten at home, the way you're getting punished, you come at school and you want to be like. No, even I can imagine, because I no. still think that, you know, even children, even if you're two years old yeah. and you something traumatizes you, yeah. it stays with you. Yeah, yeah. Even if you cannot, I, I believe that yeah. even if you can't remember it at a conscious level, it's in you. Yeah. So I, I can only imagine someone like you who's lost a sister, you've lost a grandparent, you've lost your grandparents, uh, you've seen, I'm pretty sure you saw terrible things. Yeah. Uh, I, and then on top of that, you, then you go home <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you're going through all that. Of yeah. course, I think, I, hope, I, I think sometimes that uh, Children are very resilient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they are. Especially so for this country, it's, it's a special case, mm. and for the kids who grew up during that time, it's mm. another case again. Because mm. I remember, uh, if today you ask me, like, why were we fighting? Yes, I'm not going to, because I was 
like I always had ways to start fights. Mm. If the teacher comes and say who was shouting and they point at me, that means whoever pointed at me, we are going to fight. Yes. I, during the break or during lunch time, and so I used to be like that. Um, and it went on until I finished uh, primary school. Mm. So when I went to Biman, I went with my mom. And that's I for Biman. Uh, that's the secondary school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So when I went there, my mom told me she took me there, and she said, you know, your whole childhood in primary school was mm. violent. It was violent, and because every time they would ask me to go bring, you know, you know how they send you to go and bring your parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always, I always, uh, I, I always had to bring my mom because I knew my dad was going to kill me. So, mm. and sh she was sad, but she was cool. Mm. She will beat you, and you become friends after five minutes. Mm. And you know, you know how moms are. And then uh, she said, you know, you have been a burden mm. uh, for the past six years. Mm. Actually, like seven or eight, because I, uh, I doubled like twice. Mm. And I hope this changes today. I hope they never call me again at school because mm. of, you know, your, your, your being misbehaving. You know, you, you, you misbehaving. So, and that was the last time. And you never got into trouble no. again? No. Not even when uh, uh, you were provoked? So there is a time, there is a time uh, I organized uh, a riot. Mm. <sighs> there is a time. Um, so what happened? I left Bimana and I went to Rukara. Mm. And there is a school there called uh, Groups Kore uh, Dorukara. Mm. And I changed because the headmaster where I was in Bimana told my mom that things were changing, they are trying to fix the situation, the education is kind of like not as good as it used to be. Mm. Then he asked another guy who went to school with, who was the headmaster there, because this headmaster was a cool, uh, a good friend of my uncle, mm. then they sent me to Rukara. So I did S2, S3 at uh, uh, that school. And... Um, after that, um, when I was there in uh, senior three, that's when um, that's when uh, like one month before the national uh, exams, yeah. um, we used to go to church service every morning. You know how Catholic uh, uh -huh. schools are; you have to be at church in the morning before the school starts. And I think somehow he was showing it, but he never expressed that he was like a genocide denier or Who was the, that? the the um, the we used to call them animateli. Mm. The animateli. I guess That's in the, English that that would be the patron. Patron. Right? The, yeah, yeah. The exactly. person who yeah, was yeah, in, charge in charge of, of the boys of of boys' welfare. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. So by that morning, we we used to have kids in, especially like S1 and S2, they mm. would learn after church service mm. to go to to eat their porridge at the, the refectory. So I'm being honest, it was something that was going on for some time. Mm. But that morning, that's when he said, um, uh, you know, uh, you Tutsis never get, never, Get like ni like you uh -huh. never uh, be you never you're never satisfied satisfied you know mm. so but the kid he said that too was one a survivor he had no parents mm. and when we go there he was crying in front of the door, the, mm. the refectory and when was this uh, two thousand and nine yeah. yeah two thousand and nine then um. We asked him, uh, I, I remember there was a guy called Jimmy, who was a bit older than me. He he thought, because Yaka was, uh, was a troublemaker, the kid who was crying, mm. 
he was always uh, so fighting and stuff. Mm. I was like, yo, what is going on? Why are you? So that's when he said what the, the, the patron said. Mm. Then I was like, um, I crossed the, the, the doors. Oh, the dining it, hall. Yeah, yeah, the mm. dining hall. Then um, I was like, if you guys go in there, that means you're just approving what this guy just said. Mm. So seeing the anger that was coming from the students and stuff, the guy went to the priest's uh, home, which mm. was across the school. And then it was a, I call it a funny situation, but it was bad. Mm. So the kids went to, to class. They, they, they didn't go in the dining hall. Same thing the next day. So imagine so two days of six hunger. or seven hundred uh, students. Also, it was a waste for the school mm. because you you wasting the porridge for for uh, uh, more than six hundred students. Mm. Then we had a headmaster who was a priest and also smart who knew how to manage like young people. Uh, he was also, he was always teaching us how to behave, how, you know, uh, what they call in French, savoir vivre. Mm. You know, knowing the basics of how as a guy or as a, as a, as a lady you should, you know, behave, you should. Mm. He was a very cool guy to this day. I don't blame him for, for sending me home. Uh, uh, but what he did, he didn't send me home, uh, right after. Mm that right. He came, he asked the, the, the patron to apologize to the whole school uh -huh. and they didn't want to escalate the, the situation. I think, I don't know why, because that shouldn't be something to tolerate. Um, and then after that, we met, I met with the headmaster <clears throat> uh, uh, during the break. He was like, you just wasted two days uh, uh, porridge of the school. <clears throat> Just know that any small mistake, you're gone. So before he threatened you with expulsion, because that's what he was doing, yeah, yeah, yeah. did he expel the person who actually... That's why when he said that, I was like, oh, I was expecting this to happen. That's what I said. And then a few weeks after, like a week or two, we, uh, we did the church service. So he was that guy who sits, uh, you know, where the priest sits, and he can tell who is not available at the, at the service. So right after the, the service, he came at the, at the dorms where boys used to sleep yeah. and we were like 11, 12. So he told everyone else to shower and go to class. And it was like, yo, shower and pack your stuff. Yeah. I'm going home. Yeah. Would you like to partner with us here at the Long Form? If you do, you can send an email to us at longformwanda at gmail.com. Partner with us and become part of Wanda's most exciting and in-depth podcast. So you ended up getting expelled. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, those are the stories of, of many young people uh, being misunderstood, being blamed for things yeah, yeah. outside of their control. Uh, again, it's tragic that you, mm -hmm. uh, who's reacting fairly to genocide, ideology yeah, exactly. get expelled and the other gentleman who studied everything he kept his he job kept his job and uh, me was like uh, they used to call them uh, like the envoy definitive that's like you're not allowed to come back here but, but for jimmy and other few friends they mm. were sent home for two weeks mm. so if someone is making you miss like for me it was one month before i come back for the national examination mm. And for them, it was two weeks, but before, still, the national exams, 
So someone knows what they are doing. They are trying to slow you down. Not only that you're not part of the school anymore, but uh. Um, uh, so that was the the last time uh, I was in trouble at school. I mean, but I think trouble is bad. Yeah. But then there's some good trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I think the lesson should not be that we should hide away from injustice yeah exactly but rather we should confront it yeah i i think that's also one thing i told my mom and she was like uh, no was right yeah. and she never get peace like you know because i had made a promise that i would never get sent home again or yeah. but uh the reason why i was saying that this guy was smart he was also preparing parents anytime or sending kids home he was yeah. like hey, I'm just sending you your your son. Yeah. So parents were like had always ways to get ready for their kids coming home. And yeah. So when they asked him what I did, uh, it was just like you know this guy doesn't listen to anything the school say and stuff like that. I was like, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Because when I left the school, I also went in one of the center nearby, and uh, I called my mom. I was like, "I'm coming home, and I know the headmaster is going to call you, and whatever he says." I gave her the numbers of the other kids that were with Jimmy to ask her, for her to ask them what. What happened? Yeah, what happened? And she believed me. She didn't call them. She was like, "Yeah, come home. Go back when it's time for the exams." Yeah. So I went back. Oh, I spent like a month getting ready. And you did your exams, and now you're here. Yeah. Um, I'd like to to understand, right? Because now you have you lead one of the biggest youth. I think. Yeah. One of the biggest uh, youth organizations that yeah. attempts to tell the story of, of, of genocide and what happened. Yeah. Uh, can you walk us to how you went from being an expelled student yeah. into being uh, the leader of this organization that is doing such great things? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, I went through high school, but in high school I was uh, doing computer science and management at uh, one of the Adventist schools in Nyambo called Apase. And I grew up with some friends. We used to hang out together and we started watching dance movies and there's one got uh, stone there there's one go uh, uh, you got saved was the very first one oh. then we started seeing movies like step up coming out and stuff but during that period of you got saved um, that's when we started uh, getting this passion of dance uh, modern dance and uh, there's a time it used to be called Soja Kids. Mm. Uh, it was four of my friends. Uh, Boris, who is now in the US. Bobo is now in, the, in Canada. Master did his master recently in China, but he's back now. Uh, who else? Krisha is a, a web developer. He lives here as well. Uh, and then later on, we it went fast because when I joined, it was like the last days of Kanza being in Kigali, or even when he was about to leave. And Ganza was the founder of Six City Entertainment, hmm. one of the biggest dance groups this country has ever had. So it took us like a year or two for people to accept that we are the six city without Ganza, because Ganza was like the image of this ah. dance group. Six city. Yeah, six city entertainment. 
So I used to get uh, so many questions about why Sikh, you know, it was Sikh city. And the idea was to do like Sikh stuff. If mm. It's a Sikh performance, you know, it's performance that was beyond the, you, you went beyond the expectations. Mm. Uh, so it was very hard then 2011, summer 2011, that's when we decided to have our very first show. Mm. And we called it It's All About Dance. Yeah. So It's All About Dance at Isho Art Center, Kachiru. Uh, uh, we thank Isho to this day for having our home for so many years. And we had an audience of like around 200, 250 people. Mm. Uh, paying 5,000 in 2011, mm. kids from high school was, you know, it was for us was a, a big win. Mm. Then we said, oh, this is crazy. If people are just showing up like this, we have to use this opportunity. Then we organized another show in December, 2011. Mm. So, but when we organized the second show, that's when other group were also waking up, saying, oh, we can organize that show because we were inviting around like more than 12 dance groups mm. to showcase their talent. And so after that, seeing that other groups are also organizing the dance shows, that's when we said, actually, this is something basic. Anyone can organize a dance show. Yeah. But I also told them that if we have to go beyond where we are, Mm. If we have to be, maybe remembered is a huge word, but we need to make, we need to do something that can make an impact. Mm. And I said, with the audience we have here, we can do something big. Mm. I didn't know what we were going to do, but I knew that I had ideas. Mm. So we said, as someone who, was a member of PLP who I've seen what PLP was doing and had ideas. We said, what if we start a commemoration event, yeah. a youth specifically for youth mm. commemoration event? The very first reaction I got uh, was, you know, that's for the older generation. Mm. That's not for, for us. Uh, so using words like, you know, these are mm. like for our parents. Um, I said, no, we can also learn one or two things about what happened and also try to find out. I wasn't just me. I had another friend called Abedi. He was a bit older than us, mm. but he was just a friend who used to, he wasn't part of the group. He was just, he was around. Yeah, he was around, you know, mm. and then. Somehow, we get to an understanding that we need to start something that can help us to learn our history. So that's when we started uh, correcting ideas, putting together a plan. And so our, our plan was very funny because uh, we knew the Kubuka event was very sensitive. We didn't know where to start, who to send an, uh, a letter, who do we ask for permission. Mm. So I think because Boris and Master went back to SOS, Bobo was the only one who was not boarding school, I started reaching out to, to people, to parents, to... So we have this family to this day. Uh, these two parents, their kids, uh, to this day, they are still part of uh, our group, our past. Uh, Larissa and uh, Arno. Arno, his name, his uh, his stage name is DJ Ru. Mm -hmm. He's one of the uh, DJs here now, and. His mom was very, very, he, I think the mom was the very first supportive mm. parent we had. Mm. 
And then his dad was also <coughs> asking what we're doing, how, how is it going? And they were also connecting us with other parents saying, oh, these kids are doing, you know, if you have support or anything. And then I remember the Jerry's mom uh, told me to write uh, a letter for Sonorga. Back then she was still working at Sonorga. So, three sentences. Like, yeah, six city. Uh, dear madam, dear sir, madam, you are six city entertainment, you are organizing. So when we started, it wasn't just our past event. Mm. It was let us know about our past. Like mm. asking someone who's... So it was, it was let us know about our past, yes, not just our past. Not just our past, but later when we realized that the, it's too... It's too long. It's too long. Mm. And that's how we call it our past. But with an idea of what are we asking, mm. why, why our past? We want to know about our past. If I may, uh, yeah. why... Again, you were part of a dance group, you're a young man, mm. having a good time. Why was it so important yeah. for you to, to, for us to have that discussion about our past? What, what goal were you trying to accomplish? So one, the very first thing we talked about was how big is this? Mm. Not only to us, but to the 250 audience we had for our dance show. Mm. Two, can we learn? Also, the idea of, or the thought of having a group of kids from different backgrounds, some of them, their parents, went to exile in Burundi. Mm. Others came from Kinshasa. Others came from Uganda. Some lived here. So were kids who had different point of view on the commemoration. So we said, if you want to learn, about this, uh, we have to, to start it ourselves. And this was, an idea was going on because we never, like all the four or five years as kids growing up, we were spending together, we never, Kibuka was always, for me because I went maybe to some of the public schools was that was very strict when it comes to Kuivuka. I had an idea, but back home, uh, through this process of being a dance group and spending time together, we never discussed uh, such thing. Because I remember, uh, we during that period we used to be at Boris's house uh, playing FIFA. Mm. So because. All the TVs, uh, yeah, there's nothing the raw core channels were switched off. And so these were like also, plus the questions I grew up with, some of them are mm. still looking answers for. So I, uh, I wasn't just the one. We also had some other friends who said, ah, you know, that would be great if we started something like that. Mm. So, but also, remember, it was just a dance group, mm. and the event, we, the ideas we had was to organize something that is a bit artistic, mm. having poems, having some drama, theater, um, having some songs. So, issue being a home of so many talents and in different sectors, they, there is a group that was also had their, their, their home or their office uh, that used to be called Jardin Revue. Ah. Uh, I have art and I live, or I live because I have art. Mm. If I try my... Uh, yeah. um, putting that in English. And um, we invited them for one of the dance sessions. After the session, we told them the idea we had. And I remember Dinka Carrera, may her soul rest in peace. She passed away in 2014. I remember Dinka saying, this is the best idea I've, you know, I've heard so far since I started doing this. Mm. And she was part of 
some stages before we even uh, approached her, but she said this is one of the brand ideas. And after that, um, then we started working on it. Yeah. Straight away, we started, she started uh, saying how we are going to create a group, how we are going to, share, to start uh, sharing ideas, uh, and what they can do as Jardin Je Vis, and what we can do as our past. She said, I would need like money power, I need some uh, people to act in my play. Uh, who's going to uh, to uh, to perform a poem? Who's going to do what? In like a week, we had it was too much cavuyo and so many things going on. Having the sound system coming uh, from uh, Jido, Positive Production, we also thank him for being there for us so, for so long because uh, I'm giving credit to these people because we never had a platform where we can express how we feel about their support in starting our past. Mm. Uh, he was an uncle to Boris, uh, my colleague, and we went to see him, he said how many, you know, speakers, mics, mm. stuff like that. And he get, he even the transport, he paid it mm. for the for that. Then that's how we started. Also, I didn't finish the story of uh, sending a letter to Sonarba with uh, three sentences, you know, with no Did budget. Did give you any money? Yeah, they gave me 200k, but mm. I remember very well because we got the money like four months after the, mm. <laughs> after the event. The events, uh, can, you, can you take me to that first event? Uh, was it successful? So it was actually, I don't know the word they use when something goes beyond successful. It was beyond your expectation. <laughs> beyond my expectation. One... If you look at the guest of honor, who was the guest of honor? Uh, uh, she is today the senior advisor to the first lady, mm. uh, Madame uh, Gakua Jean d'Arc. Okay. We invited her through the sons, who mm. was also part of our organizing committee because they were also cousins to Boris, mm. who was part of Six City. We send her the, 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 the message, I think it was via an SMS, going through the whole thing they're trying to do. Then later on, we went to see her at home, if I'm not mistaken, but we went to see her. And she believed in the idea we had. And she said that uh, we have her support. Uh, so, then we uh, asked uh, either Dijeru is dad or Sharon Wangan is dad, one of the two, to help us invite someone from Senerge to give us Ichigan Niro on the history. So then we have uh, two poems. It was crazy because the very first event we did, we had it for two days. Yeah. It must be, I'm, I'm hearing all of this. I'll, I'd like to ask you uh, just very quickly. Yeah. One, how many people came for the first event? Two, were they paying to attend? Yeah. Three, after you, you Maybe I'll, I'll ask the, the third question after. So, yeah. how many people came to the first event? We had around 290 people because 290. the place was like full packed to the... Where was the place? Uh, Isho Art Center. That, that, that was how big it can, mm. can two, get. 290. 290. Yeah. And two. Uh, did they pay to... No, it was the French. It was free. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Because the event we did, we, 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 we had in the past was... People you would pay. Yeah, I would pay. But we, what we said we wanted to do, we said we wanted to do a commemoration event. One, yeah. I don't know if 
ever happened before where people pay for a commemoration mm -hmm. event. But we say if you want these young people to come, we have mm -hmm. to give them something for mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. and also see where we can get the support to make it happen. I guess, so are you trying to tell me that, so I can mm. fully understand, mm. so did you get the funds to help you organize this event from your first event, for your first dance event, or did you get funds from elsewhere? It was uh, through friends, mm. parents. Mm. I don't remember how much, but uh, the Jerry's mom gave us some amount of money. I remember for transport every time after the event. I remember for the two days, uh, uh, Madame Gakuri's uh, husband uh, mm. was taking us home, mm. and the, the, they used to have a Prado was always like packed even in the with, back. With yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we we were always going through. Uh, Friends, yeah. 10k, 20k, mm. 50. Mm. Yeah. So, how that was in what year again? 20, 2012. 2012. So, yeah. now we are 2024. Yeah. So, have you had an event every year yeah. since then? Yeah. And so, first of all, congratulations. You know, Thank it's, you so it's much. easy to start something, yeah. <laughs> but it's very hard to sustain. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, I have, with a little bit of my research, I've I discovered that you know some of the things that you're now doing mm. is not just holding mm. events; it's also going out into the different districts yeah. and supporting uh, genocide survivors. Um, not only actually, not only genocide survivors, but even the children of genocide perpetrators, yes. giving them support, whether it's financial, building homes, mm. uh, paying for fees. I would really like you to help me understand, you know, what you do today, uh, why you do it, how you do it, because obviously you need a lot of funds, yeah. and uh, your goal for our past moving forward. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, one, when we started, we gave ourselves three objectives. Mm. You know, as anyone who is starting something, you have you have a goal you want to achieve. Mm. One was to educate ourselves. Mm. We're young. I was twenty, almost twenty when we we started, and I was the oldest in the group. So mm. you can imagine the rest of the group. Mm. And the goal was to educate ourselves and also educate other young people. Two was to create ways to deliver our messages in an artistic way, as I mentioned. But uh, content that can help these young people to also ask more questions about their pasts, ask more questions about their parents' past. Three was to use our force, our uh, contribution as young people to go out there. And when we started, it was just saying uh, during this period, we will be supporting the genocide survivors with the goal of making them feel like they are not left behind. Uh, they are part of this country like we are, yeah. so they shouldn't be uh feeling that way yeah. so by doing that we started after every event we were visiting different villages where we started with the uh, Chizere village in um uh kanombe sector yeah. that's in chichuchiro if i'm not mistaken we went there the very first uh, after the very first event. We had a few things, clothes that were donations from young people. We told them anything that is still in a good condition that you don't use anymore. There is someone out there that needs this. A uh, few uh, bags of rice, cooking oil. You know the home basic items. But the goal was with the two, if it's not three buses we went with 
to connect them with this family's uh, history. Yeah. Because there is, after uh, seeing this show, you say, oh, she talked about ABCD, but there is an event he said that happens here at this time and that. Let's go see, you know. So there is talking to young people about what happened, uh, the history and that, but there is also giving them the proof. Uh -huh. So how do you give them the proof? Is to take them where there is the genocide survivors, people experienced the genocide, where there is the people who got injured during the liberation struggle. Uh -huh. So that's when they be like, oh, now we can connect what we've had yeah, with, uh, real with the reality. Mm. And that was the goal of doing this community outreach. Mm. We didn't have much, but uh, the small contribution we had was always appreciated by these people. And they're always happy to welcoming us, sharing with us their testimonies and uh, helping us to, you know, to, to understand what we didn't understand them. Mm. Then, it went on, uh, 2013, we went back to the same village. Uh, 2014, we helped, I think it was like three, four families to start uh, a poultry farming mm. in the same village. Because we didn't have much people just donating the small mm. they had, but we managed, I remember we bought like 16 chicken. Mm. Then you said, if it goes well, you'll be sharing with your neighbors. So that was an idea that opened our eyes to see, okay, actually we can also add one more uh, item in our activities where we find ways we can find some of the small, small wow. ideas of these people. So 2015, we decided to change and go to a whole new yeah, village. Yeah. Mm. And through a friend of mine called Teta, uh, we used to go see her grandma because I, the reason why I used to go see her grandma, one, Teta was my friend, but every time we were there, she was telling us their stories when they were, uh, when they were living in Uganda. Uh, she would tell us about the cows, uh, she always had like, you know, those stories you want to keep listening to, you know. And um, when there is a time we were there and we talked about the event that was happening, what we were trying to do, her knowing one of the survivors from Narama, she said, you know, there is some uh, old, uh, uh, you know, a Chechuru that lives there. If you can, please. Next time you do this, also you can visit them. Mm. So that's where the idea of going to Narama came from. So we went there without talking to the local leaders, which was a mistake, uh, which was also part of the process of knowing how the channel of command works. When we got there, we had talked to one of the families. They said, yeah, you are welcome to come and we'll introduce you to the leaders of the village and so when we were there, the, um, the Mudugudu leader came. Ah. They were like, no, 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 there's no way we're going to accept your, your stuff. Because the person I had talked to was just a uh, normal citizen in that village. And she had said that she would talk to the uh, uh, village boss, uh, she talked to only uh, one of the genocide survivors uh, committee members. So it wasn't, it wasn't well organized. Mm. So the guy said, there's no way you're going to have this event. So the people were already there and we already had, through that uh, genocide survivors committee, we already had the families that we can give the donations we had. So it was bad. We started making calls, everyone calling who I know, your uncle, your aunt, who. Then we, someone 
in the group called, I don't know if it's in the local government or it's in the military, but they called someone asking to connect us with the sector uh, executive. Mm. So they connected us with the sector executive. We told her what uh, the reasons behind our trip to Nalama, mm. and she was very understanding. So she said, give me like 30 minutes. I wasn't around. Uh, just wait, and it was getting dark. But we waited for her. She came. She was like, you know, we support such ideas. We want you guys to come back. But next time, let's organize this. In a, you know? So that's when we started also getting engaged with Ibuka on sector level, then the district, then country. So that was 2015. But after that event, I went back to meet with the people from that small committee. The Genocide Survivors Committee. Survivors. Mm. So I was like, uh, I don't know if we are going to get money. But if we had financial support, what can we do mm. for this village? They're like, you know, this village was built right two years after the genocide. Mm. So some houses, you know, after the genocide, wasn't like with bad intentions, but was something that was to put in place very quickly. So some of the houses had some small, small uh, issues. So... 2015, all these years after the genocide, they said, if you can renovate, I don't know, one or two. So we gave ourselves a target of renovating five homes. Yeah. Did you, did you reach that target? Yeah, after like five years. That's not bad. Yeah. So 2016 to 2020, mm. uh, we renovated six homes. We built one house from scratch. We gave easy access to clean water in the, the, the homes of those six families. Uh, we gave uh, health insurance for those five years to 30 families mm. and the solar lights to 15 families. Congratulations. That's Thank you great. so much. I'd like to ask you one question before yeah. uh, this conversation ends. Mm. What is, what do you think is the role of Rwandan youths in keeping the memory alive yeah. and, and fighting? Because what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing now is that yeah. there seems to be a disconnect between maybe survivors yeah. and people who maybe were born after genocide. So they never really... They've only lived in a Rwanda that is mm. peaceful, that, you know, they have their full human rights. What do you think is the responsibility of not survivors? Because, you know, we've, I feel that uh, us as a society, we've asked so much yeah, yeah, yeah. of them. Yeah. What, is this, what is the responsibility of young people who have enjoyed, mm. you know, the sacrifice that, that the, the elders made. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, one, it starts from home, mm. knowing you as someone who comes from a family. Maybe the family is still there or it is not there. One or another, we need to start by knowing who we are, where do we come from, how is uh, our parents' journey to get to where here today. And also trying to, after you know you have some of the answers to those questions, mm. that's when you can even find better ways to ask the questions that don't have answers yet. Mm. So we need to help as the youth, as the younger generation, we need to help the older generation help them to help us. Mm. We need to find better ways to ask questions. Uh, we need to use every single opportunity we get with them to get as many answers as we can. Uh, two, we need to use the platforms we have. We are living in a digital era, you know? Mm. 
we are living in a world where everything is on social media and uh, the scary part is we've seen the hate speeches the genocide ideology coming back and it's bad it didn't go anywhere because if no. they're still being able to bring it back it was there the whole time uh, maybe sometimes it's not as big or as small so we should look at how these people are investing in their social medias in their kids in their siblings in their friends to deny the genocide mm. we should do the same to prove them wrong to give them the facts because the facts are out there mm. so this brings me back to how the the gap that is between the I would I would say maybe it's not the right word but I say the two generations we should find ways the older generation understand that we are still learning mm. and they should then get tired of teaching us because you know how sometimes uh, for people who have kids uh, you see the kid is coming back to ask the same questions mm. uh, over and over again and you see the go and sit there yeah. don't come back here so this should be different from uh, teaching us about our history mm. we have questions uh, this is a sensitive topic we understand mm. but for us to understand how heavy and sensitive it is you have to tell us the the do's and the don'ts of uh, our history mm. and uh, also as young people we need to use our social media platforms wisely because um, I've seen I think I was on the UN uh, United Nations page where they ask people to ask questions uh, before <coughs> retweeting something before uh, commenting on the fight that is going on between either countries or people and how you can also fast check the facts and now come back to answer or to repost or to retweet or with facts because mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing that we are missing also we had the chance uh, we are very grateful uh, i speak for our past and myself for the leadership we have as a country people today have access to education they have access to health and so many other things and one of the things we have access to is internet and the digital world. Yeah. because if you see how much they're investing in infrastructure that helps to have all these phones or the internet that is fast and so we should not just wait for uh, the older people to to come and just tell us what they have we should use these platforms to have ways as i mentioned to start these conversations and to also fight for these genocide deniers and uh, people are uh, encouraging the hate speeches and killings uh, we've seen in the neighboring countries what is going on it's crazy so the the, the only way to fight it the same way they're fighting with lies on social media we should fight with facts on social media yeah. and um, there is a there is a there is a time we invited this uh, retired uh, Kano uh, at one of our past events and he said one of the ways to fight your enemies to use the same sources he's using yeah. so when you look at for example the eastern drc with the conflict that are going going there so instead of fighting where the issue is they are just fighting on social media and the international uh, media houses and stuff like that 
So we should also use the same to uh, to counter the, 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 the lies and the, uh, the misinformation that is out there using the same facts we have today. And we have genocide museums everywhere in this country. We have books everywhere. Uh, I always, since I, since I found out that there is a podcast out there mm. of Kivuka podcast mm. that talks about from the 7th of uh, April, 1994, I think later on to when the genocide was stopped in the whole country a few days after the 4th mm. of July, because July that's when uh, Kigali yes. was liberated. So a few parts of the country were still uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, small, small killings, but people were still getting killed. So. <clears throat> This podcast, you can find it on Spotify, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it anywhere. Yeah. So uh, we should use such platforms to educate ourselves because some of the questions you ask, you'd be like, ah, actually, I know this name. I've heard uh, such and such talking about it. So uh, that's, the, that's the, 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 the ways I think we can bridge the gap. But lastly, we need the older generation to understand that we are not doing this to, to cause any trouble. We are doing this because we want to know and we want this to, we want to be able to talk about this in the next 50 years yeah. when our parents are not there anymore or when we are getting old. We want to be able to pass this on, but mm. we can't, you can't pass what you don't have. You know, yeah, what you don't have. So we need to know, we want to know, we are eager to learn about uh, their past. So we need them to also make it easier for us to, mm. to get access to. Sometimes healing is a journey. Yes. Healing is a journey, it takes time sometimes. And uh, uh, it's crazy that our country recently started talking about uh, mental health, it's been there, but it wasn't as mm -hmm. much as it is today. And we should have started 30 years ago, yeah. maybe with the uh, uh, means I understand, but you know, now we should make it a thing, uh, talking about mental health and how can we improve our mental health and help maybe our parents who are still struggling to improve theirs and also like that they can be able to to tell us more so yeah yeah Kristen. yeah thank you so much for joining me thank you so much for it's having an me. absolute pleasure thank you so much and i and i wish you all the luck in the world i yeah. uh, i will personally make sure that i am attending your event yeah. uh on the 9th yeah Nyanza, Nyanza Chichichiro. from 5 p.m. Yeah, yeah, from 5 p.m. to 8, doors open at 4. Okay, and, yeah. and I think because uh, one of the things that I think you need to remind people is Nyanza gets very cold at night. Yeah, 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 at night. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remember, uh, maybe we, have, we might have some merch uh, to sell, but just be ready, come, come, come prepared. And there's going to be poetry, there's going poetry, to be... Poetry, uh, music, song, music uh, drama, uh, testimony. Mm. And we are also working on... Uh, this year we want to... Not that we are leaving uh, everything else behind, but we want to also focus on the resilience of mm. young people in our country after 30 years. Mm. So uh, we want to also share a small, uh, a small video of what we have been yeah. doing in the past 12 years. It's mm. been 12 years, which is yeah. crazy. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what we are doing. And yeah, I hope we can learn and teach other young people. Absolutely. Yeah, something. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm excited for you. Thank you so much, man. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. If you enjoyed the conversation today, share your thoughts with us on our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok.